spin, spin, spin. Okay. Is it, uh, it says it's live. I hope it actually means that it's live. This is Squirrel here. Hello. Uh, hello from Folkestone in my 600 year old house. And oops, we still have Laura on the screen. And uh, sorry about that. Laura helps me keep track of everything and make sure everything's running well in the, in the chat and everything else. So uh, we, but we won't make Laura broadcast. That, that wouldn't be fair to poor Laura because uh, uh, that's not what she does. Good stuff. Uh, so welcome to uh, From Grumbles to Gold. Uh, this is the Squirrel Squadron weekly live stream. And uh, always glad to, to see many of you. I see people popping in now. Uh, I'll give them a few moments to appear. In the meantime, I will say hello to the recording uh, that's being made of this. So uh, we always have the recording up on the, uh, on the Squirrel Squadron forum. Uh, for everyone to have a look at afterwards. And of course, it's also on the platform you're on, whether that's LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever the other one is, YouTube. So uh, you can find us there. Uh, and hello, if you're on the recording, of course, you can't ask questions in the chat like live people can, but um, I'm always very happy to hear from you in other ways too. So um, where are you? Well, this is the Squirrel Squadron. Um, if you don't know what the Squirrel Squadron is, it's my uh, community of tech and non-tech people learning together, learning from each other. Uh, we were just, uh, Laura and I were just chatting about some new posts on the forum where people are discussing uh, various challenges and problems that they're having. Um, we had a bunch of great examples that came in from some of you, uh, so much appreciated. We'll talk about those and discuss uh, what uh, um, interesting challenges you're having with complaints from engineers or um, complaints from others about engineers. Uh, those are always good topics to, to bring up. So uh, uh, this community is uh, running, doing lots of fun things. We have these weekly events. We have a, a, a tool for um, keeping track of uh, great info sources, places to get information about technology and how to work with technology. So uh, glad to have you here. Uh, if you uh, haven't had a chance to join up to the squadron to hear more about these, it's squirrelsquadron.com. So easy. We'll have that at the end as well. Um, oh, and I should mention the upcoming events, which is uh, we have one next week uh, for executive members, which is um, uh, structure. So uh, there's a particular structure for a tech team that is much better than the Spotify model. I can tell you that. Um, and if you don't know what the Spotify model is, do not go find out. It's not worth uh, knowing about. Um, <laughs> even Spotify don't use it. So uh, we'll be talking about uh, alternatives to that, making uh, a good team structure for you. Um, I'll be in Miami in a, a week, um, in a week, no, in two weeks. Uh, so. Uh, Love to meet any of you who might be in Florida, um, enjoying the nice sunshine. It's, uh, boy, not that warm here, so I'm going to enjoy being there. Um, and uh, a couple weeks after that, I'm going to have Chris Clearfield, who, Chris Clearfield, who is an expert on disasters and learning from them. So if you've had some technology disasters, uh, come along and ask Chris. It, it'll be another live stream just like this one. Okay, so I think we have a quorum. Um, oh, and I should say this, it's very important. Um, please ask questions. You know, I, I, we're here for an hour. Um, and if you ask me an hour's worth of questions, it would be great. Um, I have an agenda here, but I could not spend any time on that. I could just answer your questions. That would be best. That's when I'm most effective and most helpful. So please jump in with questions, put them in the chat. Um, uh, if you don't mind just to practice, um, put in the chat that you're here and uh, what brought you here? What made you interested? What complaints have you heard? Um, how would you like to change those complaints into something valuable for you and your team. Um, so uh, throw that in the chat if you don't mind. I can see or should be able to see uh, the chat from whatever platform you're on and be able to respond. And if you have questions, examples, concerns, disagreements, arguments, um, those are all very welcome and uh, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, if I just talk to the screen for uh, a little while, it won't be a full hour and it'll be more boring. So let's not do that. Um, give me some, uh, some material to work with, argue with me, uh, uh, ask some questions. All right. Enough preamble. Uh, let's talk about nurses. So um, many of you are in the UK, not all of you, but um, you might know that over here we have a lot of nurses who are very unhappy and they're busy going on strike. And um, I can see a really, really, I can see why uh, they're overworked and underpaid um, very, very clearly. Um, but I want to talk about effective nurses. And uh, there was a wonderful, uh, very smart person named Amy Edmondson who was uh, busy studying nursing groups. And um, she had this crazy idea that maybe she could go to good nursing groups and learn from them. And then she could look at bad nursing groups and compare them. And she could tell everybody that, uh, hey, you'd be a good group of nurses. You'd be a good um, uh, you know, cancer ward or whatever it is that you might be uh, if you do these certain things that the good nurses are doing. What a crazy idea, all right? So uh, uh, Amy went off and, and studied all these uh, people and uh, she found something very surprising. She thought she knew who the good nurses were. 
they would be the ones who killed fewer people. That seems like a good thing to do, right? Not kill people. That would be a good outcome for a nurse. And, and also didn't do other bad things. Didn't have errors and problems and reports of, of difficulties. Uh, well, it turned out that when she went and looked at the um, nursing groups that had a lot of those, they were actually much more effective on every other measure. She said, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. So these are the ones who were reporting over and over again that they're screwing up. So I thought they'd be the bad ones, but they're the good ones. And the ones that uh, do not report very much, the ones that don't say very much about um, bad things happening, that don't report problems, those ones are doing much, uh, much worse. Uh, so she studied this and investigated, and she eventually wrote uh, several books about it. Um, the one I know is called Teaming, um, but she's written books. She has uh, lectures and so on, so uh, very much worth uh, having a look at her work. And uh, she came up with a term that you've probably heard, which is psychological safety. And she said, look, the, the good nursing groups are the ones who say, you know, we have two different types of red pills and, and we put them right next to each other. And sometimes, you know, I go to get some pills and I'm in a hurry and I pick up the wrong one. And uh, last week I almost killed Mr. Smith by giving him the red pill number one instead of red pill number two. Um, so, uh, gee, maybe we should do something about that. Uh, and, and those groups, those um, groups of nurses who actually gave that kind of report, uh, well, guess what? They moved the red pills apart and they did something to address whatever the problem was. And uh, the result is that they killed fewer patients and had fewer problems overall because they were reporting the problems. They were they had the psychological safety that allowed them to conclude, hey, this is, this is okay to do. Um, complaining, giving some um, negative feedback is something that's okay in this group. Whereas in, in other groups, um, it would be a very dangerous thing to do. Somebody might get you in trouble. You might be told off for um, having almost killed Mr. Smith or whatever it was, um, reporting on the uh, challenge, the reporting on the problem that uh, the pills are uh, in the wrong place, whatever the, the challenge is, whatever the difficulty. Uh, that was not okay. And you get in trouble with the boss. And so people didn't do it. And of course, then they didn't fix the problems. So um, she said, gee, maybe it would be a good idea if we created this psychological safety, if we caused people to have this feeling that it was okay to say, uh, this is a problem, this isn't working. And it, then we can correct the problems because they'll report them. Revolutionary idea, nobody ever thought of it, being sarcastic, of course. Um, but it, I think what was interesting is how she put it and how she discovered it, um, because it really wouldn't be intuitive to think that the uh, nursing groups that reported the most errors are actually the most effective. But if you think about it, you can see why that might be true. So that's the kind of overall thesis that I have here. I wanted to start with that story because it, it captures it so well for me. Um, when your technology team says, we have legacy code, we aren't using the best practices, um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, piece of software is uh, hard to work with, um, uh, this vendor doesn't do a good job for us, um, our customers are demanding things that don't make any sense, salespeople keep selling things that we don't have. These are the kinds of complaints I'm sure that you guys are hearing all the time. Um, that, that's a very healthy thing because you're hearing the complaints. Hallelujah. That would be a good thing. Um, and, and so the first thing I uh, want to encourage all of you to do is to listen to complaints. And we'll, we'll get some examples. We got some great examples on the forum, uh, which uh, I'll read out in a moment. Um, when you hear these kinds of complaints, think to yourself, this is a very positive thing. This is good that my team, whether it's a team you're managing or a team you're um, a customer of that you're working with, um, a team that uh, you're, you know, you're the CEO and the CTO is running the running the group. Wh however, it's structured. Um, your team uh, complaining is a very good sign. It tells you something uh, that they, it tells you that they have this psychological safety. If you're not hearing those complaints, then what you want to do is create the first thing you should do before doing anything else that we're going to talk about is uh, make sure you're generating them. Make sure that you're hearing where the problems are, that you're hearing what the difficulties are. And the way to do that is as with almost any other uh, cultural change, and that is uh, Pavlovian, right? It's like the guy with the, the dogs who were salivating. You want to praise the good behavior and um, uh, uh, not praise the bad behavior. Is that Pavlovian? I think it's Skinner, Skinnerian. Sorry, I'm getting my psychologists confused. Skinner was the guy who put his kid in a box. Okay, well, I, I don't have to put the engineers in a box. That's okay. But uh, what I'd encourage you to do is give them positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. So when you do hear a complaint or a difficulty, the first thing to do is praise the person who's telling you about it. Hey, this is great. This is exactly what I want to hear. Very helpful. Now let's deal with it. You might or might not agree with it. You might not act on it. We'll talk about how to handle that. 
but you want to praise it. You want to make sure the person hears that's welcome. You want to hear more of those and you want to make that public so other people can uh, understand that's what you want. And when you're not hearing anything, then you want to make sure that's uh, clear that uh, th this isn't okay, that you want to hear more problems. I'll just tell you one funny story. Um, the folks at Toyota um, have little, um, uh, they're called Andon lights. They're used outside Toyota now, but Toyota invented them. They're these little kind of traffic lights and you pull a cord and it makes uh, at your station on the, the conveyor, the, um, uh, uh, conveyor belt where the, the cars are, you, you pull this uh, cord and it turns something red or amber uh, to indicate something's wrong at my station, you know, I'm out of screws or uh, uh, the, the cars are coming on the, the wrong orientation or something is going wrong that's going to make me less efficient or uh, make the car uh, hard to work on or stop what's happening. And the uh, Toyota folks count how many of these and on poles there are, how many people um, uh, say, hey, something's wrong at my station. If they get too few, they stop everybody and they call them together and they say that something is terribly wrong here. Either we're not working the, the factory hard enough, we should make the conveyor belt go faster, or much more likely, you guys are not pulling the cord enough, so you should do it, and uh, here's, here's how you should um, address that. So if you see that you aren't getting enough complaints from your engineering team, uh, go take some action. Tell them, I, I'm expecting to see this. Uh, and uh, that should create the, uh, the um, culture that you want to get. There are lots more things that you could do. Uh, ask me questions and I'm happy to talk about them um, and read Amy's, uh, Amy Edmondson's book uh, if you'd uh, like to hear even more about psychological safety. Good stuff. So let me name some, uh, some examples of complaints because uh, you guys gave me some very good ones. So uh, Nick mentioned that, um, uh, that the kind of complaint he hears is tech never spend enough time understanding the product requirements and the product team don't share enough about the customer journey to the tech team. So there's a, there's a conflict between those two. Man, what a wonderful complaint, right? Because that's telling us a lot about some uh, communication difficulty that the um, uh, team's probably building the wrong stuff. Uh, so the tech team and the product team are drifting apart. Um, if you're a manager, if you're a customer of that team, um, if even if you're in the team, um, uh, just understanding that that's a commonly held belief, that that's a challenge for people in the team is tremendously valuable. So. I would strongly praise the person who brought me that complaint. Then we'll talk more about what we might do with it. Um, here's another really good one. We focus too much on big bang releases, which makes the tech team feel like they're not releasing enough features to the customers, but commercially we need to get big features out. Um, this sounds a bit more like it might be Nick's complaint. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is coming from engineers or from someone else, might be product people. Um, wherever it's coming from, again, that's a valuable complaint and the sort of thing that you can do something about, for example. You could try Elephant Carpaccio. Not our topic today, but um, uh, I often talk about and probably will considerably more in, in future uh, events how you can break up the work you're doing into uh, one day pieces. So it can be released every single day and you get new changes. Well, that's very different from a Big Bang release. And if you're seeing that that's a problem and you have some evidence of it, gee, that might help you build a case for actually making that change if that's what you want to do. Uh, so I really like those. And we have one more from um, uh, Richard, I think. I might be reading the name wrong, I'm not sure. Um, and he says, uh, Engin engineering aren't involved in product discussions early enough. But when then when they are involved in the early discussions, there's no requirements, nothing's ready. <laughs> So um, I, I think Richard might be a little frustrated with uh, hearing this particular complaint. And that's a very common response is you say, um, gosh, you're complaining about this, but then when I gave you this, you gave me another complaint about something else. It's not natural, but what I'd strongly encourage you to do is to continue to, oh good, Richard's here, excellent. I got it right, thank you. Uh, what I'd encourage you to do, Richard, is to praise the person who gives you the complaint, even when they're con contradictory complaints, because you want to hear it so you can deal with it. That doesn't mean that you're going to agree with it. So you're not going to necessarily say, great, what we're going to do is have you both early and late, or uh, we're going to have you early and not early. Uh, that wouldn't make much sense. So um, digging into it and understanding what's behind the complaint and what interests the person has, rather than perhaps their position, that um, you, know, you should involve me early or not, um, uh, uh, that's a very helpful um, thing to be able to do. You want to be able to dig in, understand the issues and the concerns uh, so that you can do something about them and, and praise them first, even when you're frustrated, because I can imagine <laughs> that, uh, that this particular complaint is um, getting you tearing your hair out, right? So um, tear your hair out in private um, or uh, let them know that it is a con contradiction and try to understand the contradiction. But before any of that, tell them, I'm so glad that you brought me that complaint. I'm very glad to hear about it. I don't understand it, 
And it may not be that we address it right away, but I'm really glad I want to hear more things like that. Okay. So let's assume that now you have some complaints, and uh, we have uh, a couple examples there of uh, actual complaints. And uh, if you're coming here, it's probably because you're hearing some. Now, if you're hearing them, what can you do about them? Well, let me tell you another story. So this is from my early consulting days. This client actually came back to me recently and had me do, uh, they're having me do some um, uh, due diligence health checks on um, on another company. Um, but uh, um, uh, this company um, had a quite large engineering team and the world's messiest release process. So the activities that the engineers would do to get from, I have a bunch of code and I've written it on my machine to actual users are getting it on the web and, and using it and ordering products um, from our company. That process between those two things was a total mess. And um, they told me all the time all about how much of a mess this was. I heard it on Thursday. I heard it on Friday. I heard it on Monday. I heard it from the engineers. I heard it from the QA people. I heard it from product. Um, I heard it from everyone. And I said, okay, great. I've got the message. I'm very pleased. Thank you for giving me all this feedback. We're now going to go do something about this, having heard enough and um, picking up uh, who, who was most concerned and who could help with it. I, I gathered all the relevant people. And what I did is I, I did a process called joint design. This is in chapter five of my book, Agile Conversations, if you want to read a whole bunch about it and see some examples. But don't worry, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know here. Um, so uh, I included all the people who were complaining. Um, I didn't care where they were in the organization, didn't care um, whether they were directly involved in this process. I wanted everybody in the room. I didn't want to leave anybody out. Um, I told them uh, uh, that I was going to uh, set a timer, and I, I think it was my phone, I can't remember. Um, but I set down uh, the timer, and I said, we're going to be talking for 20 minutes in this room, and I started the timer. That was a time box to make sure that this process of joint design didn't go on forever. Because um, just like Richard's saying, you know, man, they're telling me A and they're telling me B, we could just be discussing that forever. I imagine that's the kind of thing that you're seeing sometimes. You want to set a limit. So I, I said very clear limit. In this case, it was 20 minutes. And beforehand, what I had done was I drew on the board the release process as I understood it. So there are boxes and lines and arrows and things. And uh, I said, uh, look, this is what I understand the process to be. And what we're going to do is I'm, I have my pen and um, my rubber, and in, in, uh, in America, you would call that an eraser, whatever you, whatever you call it in your country. Um, I have those two things, and I'm ready to change anything on the board. And in the next 20 minutes, we're going to have a new release process because I'm going to rub things out and put new arrows and other stuff. But when the timer goes off, that's going to be our new process for the next two weeks. So uh, I was being very clear that there were going to be changes. We were going to be responsive to the complaints. We were going to listen and, and do something about them. But there was a very clear decision-making rule. And in this case, the decision-making rule was whatever's on the board at the end of the 20 minutes, when the alarm goes off, that's what we do. Your decision-making rule could be a person makes a decision. It could be there's a committee. It could be there's a vote of everyone. There's lots of ways to do it. But you want a clear decision-making rule so you're not stuck in the room forever. Um, and uh, then something I made a very particular point of was I had a little note just as I'm, I'm working here from notes. Um, and I would uh, look down and I'd call in people who had different views. And I wanted particularly to get people who didn't agree that step three should happen uh, uh, after step two or uh, that we should make sure to use uh, this particular tool for our releases and so on. I wanted to bring in the opposing views. And I did that specifically. I also modeled for others and I made sure to tell people to ask genuine questions. So uh, if somebody had a kind of a point making question, a leading question, don't you think we should do this? This is the right way. Um, doesn't everybody know that Spotify does it this way? So we should. Um, that kind of question I ruled out. So I, uh, I would stop anybody who tried that. But people had a genuine question, which was falsifiable, which was, would allow someone to question them and, and disagree. That kind of question I allowed and encouraged. And uh, so I wanted to hear genuine questions that might change someone's mind. Um, and uh, people were good. They, they played by those rules. And uh, we had a big old debate, I can tell you. It was 20 minutes of uh, raucous discussion. Uh, this is a, a company uh, which had uh, a lot of people from cultures that like to express themselves vigorously. Let's put it that way. So, you know, the walls were shaking. People were discussing and arguing. And this was very healthy. And 20 minutes later, we had a new process on the board. There were things that I had got wrong. I didn't understand how it worked, so I drew the wrong boxes. Um, there were uh, new ideas that came from the floor. There were some things we said, we better not touch that. That's actually working pretty well. 
And we certainly haven't fixed everything by 20 minutes. There were still lots of people had different ideas and uh, we hadn't come to a conclusion and I might have rubbed out the wrong thing. But after 20 minutes, we stopped and we said, okay, we've now taken on board the information in the complaints. We've done as much as we can. We're going to do more in the future, but right now we've done enough. So uh, our decision is now we're going to do the new release, release process that's on the board. And guess what I then said uh, is, uh, look, uh, we're going to try this for two weeks, and if it's a total disaster, I will buy everybody in the room a beer. And this was a way, my way of uh, reducing the, the risk profile to make sure people weren't feeling, oh, they, they didn't include my thing, so maybe it, it won't work. I'm, it's going to be terrible. Well, at least I'll get a beer if I turn out to be right. Uh, and uh, I find, first of all, I never have to buy a beer. Um, so I, I've made this offer to many groups that I've done joint design with, and uh, it's never happened. Um, because you get the group together, and you get a much better decision, even if it's not a perfect decision. Uh, and second, it, it really underlines that um, we're making this decision. It is a temporary decision. It may be wrong, and we know that, um, but we're taking on board your complaints. We're listening to what you're telling us. The grumbles are, are yeah, valuable. We're doing something about it. It may not be perfect, but if it doesn't work, you get a beer and we'll try again. So um, uh, I'd love to hear counter examples or um, people who have uh, a different experience or have questions about it. So please throw that in the chat. My experience is consistently, if you use these steps, if you use a joint design process to take the valuable complaints, the valuable information you're getting from your tech team or the, their customers or whoever it might be, and convert that into action through a joint design process, I have never seen that fail. I have never seen a team that really listened to the complaints and the difficulties and the challenges, put them through the ringer of a uh, uh, joint process together and, and didn't come out with something that was significantly better and address the issues and address the morale issues, right? Because instead of being uh, left, aside, left aside and um, left out and saying, well, nobody listened to me, somebody uh, tends to say who has a complaint, well, I'm still not happy with this. I didn't like how it was done. I don't think we should be using that vendor or that piece of software or whatever. Um, but, you know, they did listen to me. And um, so uh, my, my views were considered. Uh, they were rejected. I still think I'm wrong, but at least I'm going to get a beer. So uh, I have found consistently that that uh, model of management works really well, especially for engineers. Okay, Roland is here and has a comment or question. Let's see what it says. Um, too long to put on the screen, but I'll read it out. Uh, it might be obvious, but I feel like it's worth explicitly saying that complaints ought to be addressed occasionally. Just praising the complaints alone doesn't work. Oh, absolutely, Roland. Uh, I'm not sure if this was clear in what, what I've just been describing is how to address the complaints. So um, this joint design process is one way. There are certainly others. Um, but after you praise the complainant, um, or compl person who is doing the complaining, you then want to deal with the issue, absolutely. You might deal with it by um, deciding you're not going to uh, uh, take the action the person wants. You don't have to take uh, do exactly what the person asks you to do or, or anything. Um, but responding to the complaint is very important. And that's what I was talking about when I was describing the joint design process. The reason I drew the, um, uh, uh, the release process on the board, all the boxes and lines, was because I had heard complaints that were valuable. I praised them and then I took action based on what I was hearing. Um, not all complaints can be resolved, but maybe the reason why something is the way it is can be explained. Ladder of inference, Chesterton's fence. Roland, you're uh, uh, singing the, the tunes that are dear to my heart. So um, uh, certainly very good examples there of um, uh, uh, ways to handle the issue. Uh, we understand why this is here. We don't understand why this is here, so we're not going to touch it. That would be Chester's defense. Um, we, we understand the story behind why somebody got there. That's the ladder of inference. Um, so those are great methods for um, addressing and, and handling complaints, which you and I violently agree about. We definitely agree, Roland, that that would be the right thing. Roland says he was a bit slow typing. Okay, you were writing a big comment. I don't mind. So completely agree, uh, want to deal with the issues. I've given you one, which is joint design. There are certainly other ways to do that. Okay, good stuff. I'd love more comments and questions. Um, we may finish early today. That doesn't bother me. Um, but uh, I'd also love to not finish early because you guys bug me with so many um, interesting and, and uh, challenging questions. So please do that. Uh, questions, arguments, debates, um, all those are very welcome. Right. Uh, so um, now one thing I did is I, I put up as a, a picture to try to attract people here. Um, I, I put up a picture of a person who'd been kidnapped and was stuck in a chair and was was tied uh, and was being held hostage. And that's because I, I see an awful lot of um, uh, especially non-technical people, but also CTOs um, who feel absolutely beholden to their engineers. 
and they say, look, I don't want complaints because if I were getting complaints, it means the engineers are unhappy. And if the engineers are unhappy, some of them might leave. And it's very hard to get good engineers. I mean, it's a tiny bit easier. Amazon's firing a bunch of them, but you know, the really good ones, they can find a job like that. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm really nervous that my really superstar engineers are going to disappear. So I want it to be nice and happy for them. And I walk around on tiptoes being very quiet and careful and whatever they want, they get it. And of course, the problem is that creates an awful lot of resentment for other people because customer service folks aren't getting that. Salespeople aren't getting that. And suddenly, these engineers are, are getting this uh, special treatment. And also, of course, you're not getting the value we've just been talking about. You don't get the psychological safety. You don't get the uh, information. You don't get, you don't get the chance to do joint design. So um, uh, this fear is uh, really overwhelming. And uh, I really have this perception that uh, many of you uh, may feel this kind of uh, uh, hostage, that, that you are a hostage to the engineers. So uh, let me tell you a story. I love telling stories. And people tell me they like my stories. If you're here, I hope you're enjoying them. Um, so this one uh, will really curl your hair. Um, uh, I was at an e-commerce company and this e-commerce company, of course, had a warehouse and it was uh, a third party logistics company. So it was uh, run by somebody else. Um, but the warehouse had once been run by a guy called John and it was actually owned by the company. And, and then they had picked up all the stuff and moved it to a third party warehouse place. And that was much better and worked, worked uh, very well for them. Um, but John stuck around. So uh, John uh, sat in the office all day. He didn't have a warehouse to walk around in and, and do stuff with. It was the third party was doing that. And uh, John had a bunch of screens in which he did a lot of things. And these screens had been built custom for him by engineers way before my time. Um, and uh, they managed stock and they updated which things had uh, gone bad or had been discarded or uh, been lost or whatever. There was a whole bunch of warehouse management that John did. So all very good, perfectly happy with that. And uh, one day it came time for John to go on holiday. And I, as the CTO, went, went over to John and I said, great, who's, who's your replacement? He said, I can't be replaced. I said, well, that's very interesting, John. <laughs> what happens when you go on holiday? He says, we'll figure it out. Um, you know, don't worry, it'll all be taken care of. And John kept coming in. <laughs> he was supposed to be on holiday, but he kept coming to the office and he kept doing something in the corner on his computer, which he would not show me. And so I'd say, John, could you just show me what, which things you're doing? I'd like to make it better for you. Uh, you know, I'd like to improve this for you. And I, I'd really like you to be able to go on holiday. And so you wouldn't keep coming into the office. You could go enjoy time with your family. And he said, no, no, I have my job and you have yours. And so he absolutely steadfastly refused to tell me how he balanced the books, made sure that all the right items were in the right place. We knew how much inventory we had and we could not oversell and we could make sure we didn't have leftover stock and stuff. He was doing all that stuff, but would not tell me how he did it. So um, you won't be terribly surprised that I wasn't satisfied with this. I didn't just roll over and say, okay, John, I'm your hostage. You know, the only one who knows how to run the warehouse and make sure that we have the right items in there. I should mention, by the way, this wasn't a standard warehouse. There wasn't a standard e-commerce setup. Um, we had 4,000 new products every week. So um, this was much more complex than just uh, turn on Shopify, um, tell Amazon to run your warehouse, and off you go. They, we, we were not in a position to do that. Literally, totally new products were showing up every five minutes in the warehouse. And we'd have to get them on the website and sell them. Fun, uh, fun times, uh, uh, but uh, not today's story. Anyway, so we got John in there dealing with all these new products, making sure they all go to, uh, making sure they all go to the right place, but refusing to tell anybody else how he did it, um, and irreplaceable, right? So he he went on holiday. We were screwed. Um, well, you might be surprised, not be surprised that I didn't accept this. And so uh, we, we installed spy software. Now, uh, what we did is we actually put the spy software in our software. I mean, we were writing code, so we could just uh, put something in the, at the web server, would intercept the requests and um, would say, oh, this is one from John. Let's put this in the log. Um, so we knew what John was doing, what he was typing and where he was clicking and, and how he was doing each step. Um, and so we just reconstructed that from the logs. And we went and looked and we said, well, John runs this report. And then he adds these two numbers and he puts them over here. And then he uh, subtracts this from that and puts it over there. And we figured out and reverse engineered what John did. And then we fired John because um, obviously we couldn't be held hostage to, to what John was doing. Um, and uh, I, I don't think the story has to end with you firing a person uh, to whom you feel beholden. Uh, John was a particularly extreme example, and I'm not uh, uh, suggesting that uh, engineers, uh, I think uh, it's really unique in my experience. I have not, I've not met many Johns uh, who were um, uh, actively undermining their interests of their employer. Um, but there are certainly many cases 
where uh, someone is just afraid and they just say, look, I don't want to hear complaints. I don't want to know what's happening uh, because if I ask, I'm going to set off the engineers and I just can't afford that. I'm, I'm beholden to them. They are the ones who know where the bodies are buried in my code. Um, I don't even know how to write code and um, I'm dependent on these engineers, so I can't do anything. And if you're feeling like that, it's very depressing. Uh, and I talk to um, CEOs not infrequently who, who have some, some level of this uh, reaction, uh, some level of fear about what their engineers uh, will or won't do and um, how much they're dependent on those engineers. It's even worse, by the way, uh, if you have this outsourced. So if you're dependent on the agency or you're dependent on um, some third party, a group of developers who write the code for you and you can't do anything with the code, this is a pretty depressing place to be. And I talk to a fair number of these folks uh, and help them get out of their situation. So don't get there in the first place is, of course, the, the message that I have for you. Do not become uh, a hostage uh, to your engineers. And the good way to do that is the, the theme we've been talking about all the way through, which is the complaints from your engineer are, engineers are a positive sign. They mean that you're creating psychological safety. They mean that your engineers are um, trust you enough to want to tell you when things aren't working. Um, it's very similar to another type of situation. If you if you know sales well, you'll know that um, an objection is almost as good as a signature, right? If you come back and say, we don't have money, the salesman knows what to do with that. If you come back and say, oh, my boss will never approve, the salesperson will say, oh, can I meet your boss? Um, so those things are signs of interest in the same way that a uh, <coughs> the, those objections are signs of interest in the same way that the... Um, uh, complaints and, and concerns and issues that engineers raise, even if they're the kind that drive Richard bananas, <laughs> contradictory ones. I want this and I want that. I want A and I want B and they're incompatible. Those kinds of concerns and issues, if you can dig under, under them and understand what the actual interest is, is trem are tremendously valuable and uh, are not a sign that your team is about to leave. They're not a sign that you should tighten the ropes on the on the hostage, you know, be, become more um, dependent on, on engineers' goodwill. Uh, that's not the approach to take. Okay, so uh, I've covered the topics and the stories that I was aiming to. Um, I'm going to throw it open uh, for more questions if there are any. I um, uh, hope that this has been helpful so far, but uh, I would love to answer some questions if anybody has them. If not, We'll uh, close it up and uh, say thanks to everyone. But uh, I'd love some more questions or challenges. So I'll give you just a minute or so to do that. Uh, while you're doing that, by the way, I will mention again that um, if you're interested in more material like this, more, um, you know, there's a year's worth of these uh, events now uh, up on the Squirrel Squadron forum. Uh, you can always find out uh, much more about all these things. Um, and if uh, the computer will let me type, it's decided to stop. Oh, it's, it's getting a big download from somebody. So we got a good, uh, good comment here, which we'll look at in a moment. But I will put up squirrelsquadron.com. I can type squadron.com. And that's where you can find uh, many more of these, uh, uh, of these events on all kinds of interesting topics. And we just got 10 or 20 suggested at the most recent event, uh, which were um, uh, really fascinating. So we're, we're not short of uh, material and topics to discuss. OK, so we've got a uh, big comment from Richard and uh, going to respond to this. Uh, reading it out, haven't read it before here. So uh, let me take this off the screen because you can't see my can't see my skin, my, um, my chin. Right. Uh, one thing I have felt sometimes is something you mentioned in one of your emails about the session. Aren't sales and customer service burning midnight oil and making do with crappy systems too? Yes. That's often the resentment that you hear is, uh, man, you know, the, the, the engineers are getting the special treatment. You know, the, they're allowed to do this stuff. So you get the complaints from the other side outside the tech team, uh, which are equally valuable. That can tell you a lot as well. I've rarely felt beholden to the team, but engineering teams often get more freedom than others, allowed to work more remotely, flexibly, etc. And an issue is then when an engineering team complains to other teams that system A or system B doesn't work, when, as you say in your intro, I'm sure others are... Oh, wait a minute, I think it's cut off here. <laughs> Richard, you wrote an essay. That's great, but I think it's a bit too long for me to read. Um, uh, so I think I've got the thrust here, which is you get this resentment from other folks and in the organization or even from other engineers um, when somebody has privileges that uh, others don't. And they say, why do those engineers get to do this extra stuff? Why do they get to remote work remotely? Why do they get more pay? Uh, uh, why do any of those things um, uh, matter to them? And uh, uh, I think Richard's question, as you say, Richard, you didn't really ask a question, but I'll give you my reaction. I'll give you my thoughts because I encounter this all the time. Let me tell you. My reaction is that um, this is a signal of a lack of trust. 
And the fact that there's inequity isn't the source of the problem. So for example, if you take a, a sales organization, somebody who's a superstar salesperson who gets a ton of commission doesn't have a lot of resentment from the other um, salespeople, at least not valid resentment. They might say, man, you know, this person's getting a lot of commission. I wish I could get it. That That's not a problem. Or it might be, uh, you know, this person is getting it unfairly. If that's true, then you got a different problem, assuming they're getting it fairly and they're actually just selling more. What you tend to get is people saying, I want to sell more too. So you, you don't get um, uh, accusations of unfairness typically where there's a very clear, con where there's two factors. One is a very clear connection between the outcome and the, the action. So, hey, this person is selling more, therefore we're going to put more resources behind them. We're going to buy them better, you know, golf tickets or whatever it is so they can sell more. You can tell how much I know about sales. Um, uh, and uh, also there's a connection um, uh, and a, a fundamental trust that the person is, is doing something good, right? The outcome is pretty clear in sales. You can look, look, this much money is coming in. You're bringing it, you're, this person's bringing this much, you're bringing in that much. It's not too surprising that we reward this person more. And there's a kind of nice measurement in sales, which there isn't in engineering. Um, so uh, uh, the, what that's pointing to when you hear that kind of complaint, um, again, very valuable. You want to re reward people for complaining about it and then take action. The action I would take is to dig into where's that trust? Why does the trust not exist between, say, the customer service people who are burning the midnight oil and dealing with crappy systems and the engineers who might have more perks? If they're seeing that those engineers who might have extra stuff, who might work remotely or do things differently, um, are really producing valuable things that makes the customer service pe people's lives easier, so they have to burn less midnight oil, then you don't get that kind of resentful complaint. You might say, hey, wait a minute, how could we share in the same thing? How could we produce that much value? Uh, that's a, a, a useful comparison. Whereas the not so useful kind of resentful comparison is, hey, wait, you know, they get special treatment. They're special. They shouldn't get special treatment. Um, and, and, and we're being um, uh, uh, treated badly. That kind of dichotomy um, uh, only arises, I find, when there's a lack of trust. Uh, and so I'd be digging into that and working on trust conversations and test-driven development for people and all the tools that uh, that I talk about for building trust. Uh, happy to say more about that. All right, uh, Richard, I hope that's helpful. That was a long uh, essay and a bit of a long response from me. Uh, I hope that's meaningful and, and gives you some ideas. Um, feel free to say more. Um, maybe, maybe write uh, m multiple posts so that I can see the whole thing if you're going to write an essay, which I don't mind at all. Uh, Reluca says, uh, what if after the joint design process, some of the participants continue to complain? Uh, well, I think that's a good thing, right? So I'm going to be in favor, full um, favor of, of complaints mode. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not going to be unhappy <laughs> with the complaints sometimes. I'm going to tear my hair out and say, oh, man, I can't believe this. Got same complaint, different directions. Man, uh, I'm, I'm, I have a real challenge here. You're not always going to feel great, Ruluka, when you get the complaint. Um, however, uh, uh, if, if the participants are continuing to complain, you want to find out, what is behind those complaints? Because look, we had the joint design process. We're taking action on this. Tell us what, what's the issue here. I'm very glad you're bringing me a further issue. How is it different from what we already dealt with? Now, if the person is just repeating the same thing, that's one you can shut down. So you can say, look, I've already heard that complaint. We're dealing with it. We're taking these actions. Um, so uh, we're, we're not going to discuss that any further. I give you permission to, to, to stop that if you're just hearing the same thing over and over, if it's uh, a, a literal repeat. But much more frequently, what you hear is, well, look, we have this kind of issue and we're dealing with that, but we have completely left out the customer service side of the equation. Oh, man, we left out the people who, who work in uh, these remote locations. We've dealt with the home office, but um, uh, we, we didn't think about how this affects uh, people in uh, the Portuguese office or the Romanian office or the Remotistan office. Um, so uh, it, it seems to me that continued complaints mean you probably haven't dealt with the whole set of issues. Uh, so I would dig into that. I would welcome the complaints. If they are repetitive, shut them down. If they are not repetitive, then we missed something. So we better go back and do some more joint design. Okay, I hope that's helpful, Ruluka. Happy, happy to say more. Uh, James says, good Q&A. I agree completely. I love these. Uh, Nick is here. Nick, you had great examples. Thank you for that. Uh, how do you harmonize prod versus engineering when they're fighting for time to work on the prod versus engineering roadmap? I'm sorry if you answered this. No, <laughs> I missed the start because of production issue. Sounds like they might be fighting over those issues. All right. Um, 
So uh, I don't believe in having a separate product and engineering roadmap. Uh, maybe I should do a separate event on this. I'm, I'm happy, I'll talk about it now, but you know, I could talk for an hour on this topic because uh, I see that very frequently and I don't see it as very helpful uh, when you have this concept of um, there, there's some things that we do and they fall in the tech bucket and they're sort of so technical, no customer could ever understand them. Uh, just us special engineers, uh, we know that they really need to be done. We need to do this refactoring and rebuilding and um, uh, make sure we follow the best practices and undo the legacy code. That's the worst thing I ever want to hear. And I shut that down very quickly um, when a client brings me in to, to look at this kind of thing. I say, engineers, you have a responsibility to the company to make sure that uh, you produce more than your salary. The, the, the outcome is a profit from the investment of the company in technology. And technology is such a great lever that um, you should be able to make a huge profit. Uh, you should be investing a certain amount in, in your effort and the servers and other things that go with it and um, getting a huge reward back. So you should be able to then take uh, the um, technical activity that you want to do and put dollars and cents behind it. You should be able to explain why that is uh, worth something to the company. If you can't, we aren't going to do it. And guess what? We have some very good people who are excellent at deciding on pounds and pence and which things are more important, which things are less important. They're called the product team. These are product managers, um, for those who might not know this. Um, and uh, uh, if you don't have product managers, you have a different problem. So we should talk about that. But um, uh, Nick does. He has product managers. And uh, he's saying they're fighting with the engineers. Shut down the debate. This is not an issue. Uh, uh, we can have a different issue. And the issue should be, um, I think that my feature, uh, my um, change, my refactoring, my improvement, uh, removing, uh, uh, you know, adding microservices, whatever it is the team wants to do, that that's going to make the company more money than adding the latest feature, the wizziest button, the new report, whatever it is that the product people are going to do. And that's a useful discussion. That's a, a valuable, um, uh, uh, productive debate. Um, which you can resolve through the normal product process. Again, if you don't have a good way of doing that, you have a different problem, but we should deal with that too. The point is, I would stop the product versus engineering roadmap, put it all on one roadmap, put the product people in charge of it, and uh, step back a little bit because there may be some fireworks, but they're going to be much more productive fireworks. Nick, I hope that's helpful. Very happy to talk more about it. Uh, Reluca says, is this is useful. Great. Uh, Richard says, I'm not sure I'm meant to answer. Richard, you are happy. To, I'm totally happy for you to answer. This is exactly the kind of debate and discussion we have on the forum and that we have in our Zoom calls and in our live sessions and so on. So jump in, comment. I might disagree. You might disagree. That's perfectly healthy and fine. Uh, what does Richard say? He says, uh, one thing I found is that the relationships between product and engineering at all levels is really important. No argument. And that's why I say what you want is this productive debate this productive conflict between them, not an unproductive one, right? So when they're saying, hey, wait a minute, I want time for um, uh, for my special uh, refactoring and my other thing, and the, the product people say, they keep taking 20% of the time and it's never 20%, they take too much. This is not a helpful discussion, right? This is not a productive conflict. If they uh, can respectfully and um, productively have a debate over how much money they're going to make from one action or another, that's really useful, and that's going to be based on a very valuable, um, uh, uh, trusting relationship, exactly as uh, Richard is pointing out. Nick says, it's interesting, excellent. I wake up in the morning hoping to be at least interesting, and uh, I, I hope even more to be provocative and uh, um, uh, uh, challenging and uh, make people think. So that, that's what I'm here to do. If I've uh, given you some food for thought, Nick, that's good. Richard says, plus one to having only one roadmap. We have only one roadmap, not through design, but through these good relationships. Hey, that's even better. I don't mind that. Uh, if you uh, happen into a good practice, I'm never going to argue or debate about that. Good stuff. Nick says, uh, so should I hide if I tell you we also have a data roadmap and a DevSecOps roadmap? No, Nick, you should phone me so that I can come and work with you and help you to solve that because that sounds like a, uh, a uh, re recipe for unproductive de debate and, and also for paralysis. Um, uh, and this is actually a perfect lead into the topics we're going to do next week. So you should definitely come uh, to the Zoom call next week on feature teams and handoff hell, because uh, that sounds like handoff hell, uh, like the ninth circle of, of handoff hell. You're going to have the data people handing off to the dev sec ops people. I'm not even, I, I know what that term means, but I'm not sure what it means for you or how they might be interact. And then you've got the product people and the engineering people. H how are these folks ever going to collaborate? And as Richard has said uh, very effectively, um, the, the key is the good relationships among those people so that they can organically create a common strategy, which makes money for the company. Ultimately, we keep score with money. 
And um, if the engineers and uh, data and DevSecOps can't point out this is how we're going to make money from our activity, it doesn't belong on any roadmap. So uh, I hope that's a helpful uh, perspective. Uh, I'm open to more comments and questions. Um, we're, we're, uh, we've still got another uh, few minutes before the end time. Um, so, uh, uh, oh, here we have something. Uh, Ninth Circle Handoff Hell sounds like an awesome 90s rock album. Okay, great. I do not think you want to hear me playing air, um, uh, electric guitar. I, I think the results would be uh, cacophonous at best, which, which might work well in a 90s rock album. I don't know. Um, uh, Nick says, one roadmap to rule them all. Excellent. I may steal that phrase. <laughs> I may use that to promote next week's event, which I hope I'll see you at. Now, um, I will just one more time here because I think we're coming down to the end. I don't see more comments, but I'd, I'd love to. Please throw them in. I will say that if you have not uh, signed up for the squadron, and I know several of you have, um, uh, have a look at squirrelsquadron.com. Uh, I send an email once a week uh, with provocative ideas. Um, I uh, uh, have these events every week. They're always free. This is my way of giving back. You know, I do consulting uh, for loads and loads of companies, but um, I want to bring those ideas here so everybody can learn from them. And, and I want to make sure that the community is discussing and, and tech and non-tech people are debating just as uh, Richard and Nick and, and Roland and everyone has been here today. Uh, so uh, that's where we do it on, at squirrelsquadron.com. I'd love to see you at more events. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Really appreciate it. Great debate and discussion, as always. Uh, we'll have follow-ups on the forum. Uh, we'll have the uh, event next week and uh, lots more coming up throughout the year. Uh, I even have some paid-for workshops. I'm not going to sell them for you, but have a look on douglassquirrel.com, and you can see uh, uh, strategy workshop and uh, um, getting most from your tech team and some other good stuff. So uh, love to see you at those. Oh, Richard has a final question. Let's get that in. A question which maybe we didn't answer. Maybe it was your yes and discussion a while ago. Well, Richard, I don't see your question. So um, Richard, I'm gonna invite you to, to put that on the forum uh, because I, I, I'd love to answer a question, but I don't see it. <laughs> maybe maybe you're busy typing it. Uh, maybe one for another day. How about that? So Richard, go to the Squirrel Squadron forum. If you're not on it, um, ask me, go to Squirrel Squadron, you'll see the email and so on. Um, we'll get you on the forum and, and ask your question there. How about that? Okay, uh, good stuff. Wonderful to see all of you. Hope to see you at future events. Squirrelsquadron.com is the place to do that. Um, and uh, we'll, maybe we'll close with Richard's finer, final comment. Uh, I love the idea of praising complaints, but how do you handle the fact that you can't solve all the complaints? Aha. Uh -huh. Put that on the forum, uh, Richard. We'll, we'll have a look at that there. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate your time, and uh, see you again next week. Thanks. <laughs>